Hello and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune. As you know, I'm Maya, the singer, the songwriter, the video maker, the Oakland native, and oh boy, am I a TV watcher, obviously. I'm also a huge history nerd. I love untold stories, gross facts, and secrets, anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. Each day, I'm going to share some of my favorite deep cuts with you, so let's dig into today's stories. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365 with MXM Tune. Today in 1953, color TVs went on sale for the first time. The FCC had approved RCA's dot sequential color system less than a month prior. It was tough for RCA to get the TV ready to go on sale in time, but they wanted to give it a holiday push before the new year. They hoped that watching the New Year's Day Rose Parade would be irresistible. They set up 20 special events for people to view the parade on color TVs across the country. It wasn't just impossible to buy a color TV at the time. Most people had never seen one. The only time people had seen color TVs was at a showcase at Rockefeller Plaza. RCA had to get a move on in order to make sure that people would be able to watch the parade in color. They sent 200 versions of the set to their top dealers and the dealers set up viewing parties. Most of the parties were held in hotel ballrooms. Instead of big screens like you'd imagine today, the events had black and white 21-inch sets in rows alternating with 12-inch color sets. It doesn't sound too exciting now, but at the time it was a huge deal. Plus, the contrast of the color and black and white sets showed just how different it was to watch TV in color. RCA and CBS were competing to become the first manufacturer of the color TV. Even though RCA ended up winning the battle in the end, it didn't always seem that way. CBS had passed the first test, while RCA had failed due to low picture quality. Despite CBS's early success, they hit some roadblocks when manufacturers suddenly weren't interested in producing their color TVs. CBS pushed them, and they resisted even more. RCA got back in the game by working on a system that would be compatible with the already existing black and white TV sets. This was agreeable with the manufacturers, but RCA needed time to work on their rotating disc technology. RCA then made a pretty bold move against CBS. They sent letters to 25,000 television dealers stating that CBS was working on an incompatible, degraded product and warning the dealers not to work with CBS. That obviously didn't help the already tense situation with CBS and manufacturers. RCA even sued CBS, which further slowed down the potential production of color TVs by CBS. That whole kerfuffle led to RCA being the first to manufacture the color TV, just in time for the New Year's. The TV sets were called Model 5, and they were prototypes with a dark cherry finish. The Model 5 that was used in the demonstrations nationwide is still visible today at the Early TV Museum in Hillard, Ohio. The cities that held color TV demonstrations were New York, New Haven, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Wilkes Bar. Baltimore, Denver, Omaha, St. Paul, Washington, Philadelphia, Johnstown, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. After the events, it only needed a few finishing touches and changes to become the CT100, which was the first mass-produced color set. They started manufacturing those the following March. By the time the sets were for sale to the public, they were $1,000. That's like $8,000 in today's dollars. If you've checked out Best Buy recently, you probably know that today you can get a decent color TV for under $300. Even after all of that, Time Magazine still proclaimed the color TV to be the most resounding technological flop of 1956. Of course, that proclamation in and of itself turned out to be resoundingly wrong. It's just that it wasn't until 1968 that the primetime shows on the three major networks started to be broadcast in color, and in 1956, less than half of homes had a TV in the first place. In 1972, sales of color TVs finally surpassed sales of black and white TVs. Today, well, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a black and white TV for sale anywhere. Today, in 2015, Pink Guy released Rice Balls. He uploaded it to the TV Filthy Frank channel on YouTube. The song is a jab at fans who hassle Pink Guy to create real music. In the music video, Pink Guy makes onigiri and raps. Let's get this straight really fast. Japanese musician George Miller first did his first music releases under Filthy Frank. Then he did a series of releases under the name Pink Guy because he would wear a pink suit. But today we know him as 
Joji. Joji started out on YouTube with comedy as songs like this, more of a parody style than where he is now. If you've been following Joji since the beginning, you know that he started out on YouTube with like comedy-esque songs that were just super, super raunchy and inappropriate. And today he's a total jack of all trades. He still sings and he writes songs, of course, but he's also a record producer and an author. Joji's an amazing example of going from YouTube channels to total stardom. And one of the first people that I watched make the transition from YouTube over to another area of the world. It's wild to me now that I can exist kind of in the same lane as Joji and even be compared to him on occasion as another artist within, I mean, I think like the bedroom pop spaces really. So I don't know. I have adored his stuff from the very beginning and it's been really cool to see his progression as an artist. And now for today's final segment, I'm going to be going into my own photo archives to see what I was up to on a December 30th in my life. December 30th, 2019, I went to an animal sanctuary in Japan and it was really, really cool. I got to go really close to a bunch of animals that I never thought I would have been able to go near before. I think it was ethical. I'm not entirely sure. It was hard to tell because everything was written in Japanese, Um, but it was really cool, at least from a visit experience. I fed koi fish and there was like Um, there was a big tortoise in the middle of the whole thing and there were sloths and there was a toucan and a bird. I don't know. I had a good time. Let's go back in time again tomorrow. Remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and follow along at 365 Days MXM Tune on all platforms. It's 365 with MXM Tune. New facts every day, so... Don't leave too soon, I'm gonna teach you stuff, no it won't be tough, gonna go a year till you